Good afternoon, welcome to Chamber Live. Uh, today we're looking at business motoring, managing your vehicle or fleet in lockdown and beyond. Uh, the views that are expressed in this seminar don't necessarily represent the views of the East Lancs Chamber of Commerce, uh, but all facts were believed to be correct at the time of recording, which is the 11th of May, 2020. Time to introduce our guest speaker this afternoon, Mark McLaughlin, AMICFM, perhaps he can explain what those letters stand for. He's MD of Ribchester-based finance and fleet management specialist, Keyfleet. And Keyfleet arranged vehicle and business funding for individuals and businesses, as well as advice on vehicle selection, fleet electrification, and they also offer a range of fleet and risk management services that I'm sure we're going to hear about this afternoon. Mark himself has got 23 years experience in the automotive finance and fleet management sector. He's worked at businesses such as Haydock Finance, Lloyd Bank, MNH Platinum, uh, Bowker, Motoring Group. He's just uh, maximised his screen, which has killed my script. So, Oh, I'm so sorry. I know I'm that's sorry. fine. It's fine. It was your bio. Nobody else needs to hear the rest sorry, of it. Sorry, Mark. Let we me getting introduce bored of it anyway. our, next, our guest speaker for this afternoon, Mr. Mark McLaughlin. Over to you, Mark. Good day. I don't want to clap myself. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, and thank you for that, Simon. And thank you for... Uh, accommodating and arranging this this afternoon. I was hoping to see a few bad haircuts today, but unfortunately it would seem as though I am suffering more than most in that department. And for that, I apologise in advance. So um, great to see you all. We've actually got a few people on with us today that are, are from the uh, fleet industry. I've already, already mentioned to Mark and Az and Jan, if you wanted to add your two pennies at the end of this or throughout it, just, uh, just chirp up. It's pretty informal and, and quite conversational. So any information you've got for us would be handy. Um, <clears throat> just a little overview of what we're gonna to cover today. So I'm just gonna talk a little bit about the impact of um, COVID-19 and the lockdown on motorists and fleets generally. I'm gonna share with you a little bit about the government guidance, um, a few best practice tips about safer driving currently and also coming out of lockdown. Um, just want to get your minds thinking as well about um, any opportunities that might arise as uh, you know from the negativity. Is there something that we can do that's positive coming out the other side of it? And that leads nicely into my kind of final bit, which is about getting organised and just just touching briefly on on things that businesses should be doing to uh, be compliant and following all the rules and regs that they uh, they should be doing. So without further ado, this, this should take about. 20 minutes and uh, at the end of each slide just to make sure nobody uh, nods off we are going to be asking um, for your participation in in yes no answers to a, a poll that we're going to be doing completely anonymous so please feel free to uh, to share with us so the impact of, of covid on on businesses and motorists well as we all know looking at from some of the backgrounds a lot of us are at home at the moment we've been told um maybe not as clearly as some other pe as some people would like but we have to keep the roads clear we have to only reserve our driving for essential purposes i think some people's interpretation of what's essential or not is different to others but uh, but generally speaking you can see from that graph on the right hand side that the amount of mileage that's been <clears throat> taking place on UK roads has been massively diminished over the last few weeks. Um, at one point, I think there was something as much as 80% less miles being uh, driven on UK roads. You can see that starting to creep up a little bit as of the 4th of May. A um, little bit concerning. I think that maybe some people are uh, thinking we're, we're, we're closer back to normal than, than what we maybe are, and I expect that trend to uh, increase if we looked if we fast forwarded these stats uh, another week but uh, I certainly think that there is some light at the end of the tunnel now um, in the actual motor trade itself a lot of the manufacturers have postponed production um, dealers have been closed a lot of garages have been closed or offering only kind of a, a skeleton staff and, and, and uh, a minute level of, of service um, again I wrote this a few days ago I think that's going to be changing this week um, Mark's with us today from Service Point, probably be able to tell us a little bit more about what garages are doing for servicing and MOTs and things like that. Um, and of course, it's affected our daily lives. There's no flights, you know, driving lessons cancelled, deliveries, some cancelled. And it's resulted as well in a lot of vehicles being dormant or mothballed on people's driveways or streets, which in itself presents um, a little bit of a, a challenge as well, certainly for, uh, for businesses. 
Um, one of the big impacts that we've all felt, I'm sure, private individuals or companies, is you know these vehicles still need paying for, um, regardless of whether or not our revenue or our income may have been affected. And lenders have been offering support in that respect. Um, you know, there's, there's a few different ways that lenders have been helping. I mean, there's two ways in particular, and I just kind of ask you guys to consider whether or not these payment holidays that people have been taking have got any implications further down the line. Um, I've took a, a three month payment holiday on my own private vehicle, um, but I'll be paying that back at the end of the contract, which means the vehicle's going to go back and I'll have three more months worth of rentals to pay. Now, it's not too bad. It's, uh, it's better than paying the, the payments currently, um, but that could be problematic for people looking to find deposits or rentals again at the end of agreements. Um, another way to, to approach this maybe with the uh, lenders or the leasing companies is to um, look at actually formally extending your contract. You can take the sting out of that money that, that's owed at the end. You could maybe take a, a three, four months left on your contract situation and extend that by 12 months and therefore achieve more manageable rentals over uh, a longer period while still taking advantage of the holidays. Um, so that's a bit of an overview on that. At the end of each of these, um, like I mentioned, I'm going to be just taking a, a, a brief poll of, of attendees today. So Simon, this would be the first poll question, which is, have lenders um, been supportive as far as you're concerned in terms of finance and, and lease agreements? So that should just pop up on your screen. So if you can answer that for us, we'll, um, we'll see the, uh, the results on the screen in a moment. Simon assures me. If it doesn't work, it's Simon's fault. Oh, it's working. We're up to 72% of people are at least awake, Mark. So that's a good oh, sign. Oh, well, that's a bonus. That's I'll, give a bonus. Her, I'll give them a few more, a few more <laughs> seconds. No worries. And we'll call, no it, worries. We'll, we'll call it there and share the results back. There you go. Okay. Not surprised me, actually. So not, not everybody's felt that they've been um, super supportive. Um, yeah, okay, no problem. Thank you for sharing that, guys. Right, on to the next slide. Government response and uh, guidance. So, um, there's a few things here, and I've kind of just kind of brain dumped this out, so apologies if I jump around a little bit, but um, you can actually be fined for non-essential driving at the moment. Uh, I believe it's a £60 fine, which reduces if you, if you uh, pay it within a a short period of time so that's that's something for you guys to uh, consider and um, petrol stations have been uh, deemed high risk i presume that's to do with the high level of footfall that goes through and the hands on the pumps etc um, and again the, the guidance has been that more driving means more incidents it may not be the drive itself that is causing a risk but if you have a breakdown or you're involved in an accident that's involved in emergency services hospitals interaction all that type of thing um, one big uh, piece of assistance that the, uh, the government stepped in with was the suspension of vehicle testing. Um, and all of my colleagues that's on the uh, call at the moment, Mark was looking to book his vehicle in for an MOT last week, uh, not required. If your MOT was due on or after, I think it's the 30th of March, for a car, van or a bike, you've got a six month um, extension, so to speak. And for HGVs, buses and trailers, it's a three-month extension. That's not a pass to uh, drive uh, vehicles that aren't roadworthy and unsafe, but it is an extension to actually getting the, uh, the, the test done itself. Um, with regards to servicing, servicing isn't a hard and fast date like a, an MOT or a road tax um, certificate. Um, it's uh, it's something you your major concern there is whether or not you're invalidating your manufacturer's warranty. I suspect, and I don't know this, but I suspect that there'll be a level of tolerance applied there. And to be honest, the vehicles are literally not moving within this next few weeks and months. So um, again, if anybody's got any more information on that, that'd be interesting. But it's, if you can't get the vehicle serviced, you just cannot get it serviced at the moment. <clears throat> They're also recommending that you sanitize um, your vehicles. There's a lot of guides online to how you can keep your uh, vehicle clean and sanitized throughout this. And also uh, something that not a lot of people know, but the HMRC actually issued some guidance where your company car drivers could essentially get a break from benefiting kind implications, i.e. company car tax. 
Um, if you ask me the, the instructions, which I'll not go through now, um, the, the, the reward doesn't really seem worth the effort, to be honest, for the sake of a, a month's worth of uh, company car tax reduction. And to be honest, at this point now, it may even be too late to look at stuff like that. But there has, there has been things that the government have put in place and um, they did actually classify transport as an essential industry as well. So they've certainly been looking at it, looking at it as an important part of the, uh, the jigsaw. A um, few tips on, on safer driving now and coming out of this the other side. Um, the first one, that, that was me talking to myself actually, I've forgotten how to drive. Um, do you only come back off holiday and you've kind of, you get behind the wheel and it just doesn't quite feel right. I think that's something that your, your colleagues are going to uh, suffer from, um, as well as maybe putting a shirt on for the first time in two months. That might be a bit foreign to them as well. But, and, and the way that I've, I've kind of thought about some of this information is, I think you could put something like this in an email to your drivers just to give them some best practice about what they should and should be considering if they're going to jump back in their uh, vehicle. As I mentioned earlier, even though there's no testing, it doesn't mean there's no responsibility. You still need to make sure these vehicles are, are right. So, you know, if you have got a regime in place where you're getting vehicle condition checks, please continue to get those. Um, some garages, if you if you look hard enough, have been open for servicing or throughout this period. Um, a lot of them have, have dropped down just to essential workers only. I think this week and beyond, we're going to see more and more garages uh, reopening. Um, there's also some guidance around um, you know, making sure you continue to turn over your battery. Um, I've seen some guidance where they recommend that you run the vehicle for 15 minutes every two weeks, but the sub subject to conjecture, really. I mean, ideally, you would just kind of give the vehicle a little bit of a, a, a drive around the block. Might not be possible in today's uh, climate. However, um, you know, just being mindful of your battery going flat is, is something to consider. And it's not just your battery, really. I mean, as would probably back me up, your tyres being static in the same position for weeks on end is not good for the rubber. Your aircon suffers from not being run for a period of time. Um, even with an electric vehicle, you, it needs to be put into on mode, certainly for a period, just to keep um, the vehicle awake, so to speak. Um, if you have got people that you're, you're having in your vehicle, even valeters, just have a think about how they're protecting you and themselves. Are they wearing like this chap on the right, gloves, mask, et cetera. I had my vehicle valeted um, last week and the guy didn't have any protective stuff on at all. I had to kind of approach carefully and clean up after we'd cleaned, so to speak, but um, just something to consider. Um, I'd instruct your drivers to avoid refueling if not necessary. I think a lot of people like to have a stroll out to the garage to top up every now and again. Um, it's not important to do at the moment and it's certainly not the safest place to, uh, to spend your time. Um, if people do have to get on public transport when we come back to work, consider whether or not you might want to make an adjustment to their hours so they can avoid uh, rush hour. Um, because being on a bus with three people is a lot different to uh, 33, as I'm sure we can all attest. And car sharing, just make sure that they're... Uh, you know, the guys are maybe keeping the windows open and doing extra cleaning and, and things like that and remind them of the government guidelines. One thing to, to bear in mind is when these vehicles have been static or certainly been used for a lot less over the last few weeks, it's guaranteed to see a pro rata increase in breakdown for both company vehicles and people using their own vehicles for business journeys. That's what we call grey fleet. Um, and just have a look whether or not your guys have got sufficient breakdown covering to support them throughout um that time as well. So, um, so at the end of this slide, I've just got another um, little poll here. It's just just my own interest, to be honest, more than anything. I'd just like to know from you guys, Simon, if you can pop in with this. Do you have staff in your business that use their own vehicles for business journeys? You might, if you've been on any of these with me previously, or you've even met me, I've probably mentioned the term Grey Fleet to you, which is that very thing. It's people using their own vehicles for business journeys and those need to be managed in exactly the same way as your company vehicles. How are we doing Simon? Waiting for the last stragglers to come in, we'll give you three seconds. It'll be that John Evans, it'll nod it off again I'm sure. Okay there you go. Let's have a look. Um, sorry there you go. Okay. I, did, I don't know if you remember, Simon, I did ask that same 
question at a curriculum event um, this year, last year, I forget, and it literally felt like the entire audience put their hands up. They all did, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, pe people using their own vehicles for business journeys, very, very prevalent um, and common. Okay, um, new thinking and opportunities. Um, I don't know if any of you read in the press, but apparently the, um, the attitude towards people using public transport as... Um, well, the people that were using it has, has really, really changed. And a lot of people now are looking to um, actually get a vehicle that they can use as, as an alternative to public transport because of the health risks. Conversely, um, I think that's probably with the general public, people that are using public transport not for business journeys. I think the reverse of that is that people that are in company vehicles or vehicles they use for business probably going to do less miles. I mean, I don't if I, I probably... Uh, should have put this as one of the questions but if you're anything like me I'm sure you're imagining a, a future where more remote, remote working takes place maybe less face-to-face -face meetings and in turn I think that's going to result in a in a pro rata reduction in the amount of business miles that your average um, company car driver um, does and um, that could present an opportunity for remodeling your lease agreements with your finance uh, companies and um, they won't all put the contract payments down in accordance with mileage they're a lot quicker to put them up the other way i must admit but um they, they should be open-minded in many cases to uh to having a, a conversation with you one of the things i keep hearing is that um obviously we're putting a lot less co2 out into the the um the atmosphere at the moment and i can't quite see it myself but i've heard a lot of people that are actually saying that this is uh, visible when they look out the window and they can actually see that the, the world's a bit of a clearer place. I'm not quite there myself, but it's certainly a good thing that, that less vehicles are on the road and less emissions are, um, are going out. And, and that fits nicely into the commitment that uh, we have to um, the road to zero, which is the road to zero emissions from the transport industry. The government said by 2030, we'll have a minimum of 50% of all brand new vehicles purchase lease registered um, will be electric or certainly ultra low emitting vehicles and I just wonder if this reduction in mileage a new modern way of working where we embrace technology and maybe just a, um, the idea of a leaner meaner type of working environment whether or not that just brings further up your agenda whether or not it's time to look at electric vehicles and hybrids and new technologies because it, it, if you get it right it can save you an awful lot of uh, of money and maybe with less mileage some of that range anxiety maybe just goes out the window a little bit as well so to summarize really there's an opportunity through reduced journeys and, and achieving reduced cost you can look at more efficient vehicles and um, maybe remove a little bit of that anxiety over the charge network for electric but it's also an opportunity i think to um to get organized and maybe just look at whether or not your business has all the policies and compliance pieces in place to run vehicles um, on behalf of the company. But before we come on to that next slide, we've got one um, penultimate poll, um, which is, are you considering the switch to electric vehicles? Um, certainly something that we've been talking to our clients about a lot recently it seems like every other conversation is about electric vehicles i've finally acquiesced to getting an electric vehicle and my vehicle's up in in september um i wasn't sure if i would but a lot of my friends and colleagues have been getting their uh, teslas and jaguars and i3s and things like that and uh, i think i'm ready to uh, to make the switch but i'm just interested to know whether or not you and your business whether or not that's something that you're considering for next time. How are we doing, Simon? Should hmm. just be seeing the results now. Okay, so two thirds of us are considering the switch to electric. I think you've got to look at it, haven't you, at least. It's not for everybody, but um, when you can save a lot of money and, and the vehicles are attractive, I think it's, um, it's something that you should look at. <clears throat> and you can talk to companies like us and, and other businesses who can help give you a steer on, on that type of thing. So final slide, um, I, I often say terms like compliance, duty of care, occupational road risk, and this is the part of the, the presentation where people start nodding off. But what it basically means is that if you've got people that are driving on behalf of your company 
and that means driving a push bike, your own vehicle, a company car, a company van, whatever it may be, you have this responsibility to make sure they're doing that in a safe way and you're providing a safe environment in which for them to conduct that business activity, which is driving. So in accordance with health and safety regs, all businesses that have people driving on behalf of uh, that business need to have a few things in place. And I'm not going to kind of go through all of it now, but I'm just giving you a little bit of an outline there, just to give you a little bit of a feel for the type of things that you would need to have in place in order to be comfortable that you are indeed compliant and the company couldn't accuse of being negligent if um, there was an incident or a problem. Um, the first thing you would do is, is conduct a, um, an assessment, a gap analysis, an audit. That The findings of that audit would then help you create a policy to help mitigate and manage the risk. And then you can issue a driver-facing version of that um, information through a handbook. By the way, if, you, if you've just got one of those three, you've not got the full kind of three party that you need. You need the audit that informs the policy that informs the handbook. And part of that policy may well be that you conduct regular driving license checking. And I don't mean glancing at a, a photo card of once a decade. I mean actually digitally checking that information with the DVLA and also a regular vehicle checks. And we've got Darren on here with us today from CheckSafe. That's his business. Checking vehicles, for me, just like um, checking licenses, is Fleet Management 101. If you're not checking those two things, you're not in the game, so to speak. So those are the types of things that, that businesses need to do. Um, in my experience, if I talk to 10 businesses, nine and a half of them aren't doing what they should be doing. It's a reasonably quick fix. It sounds like there's maybe a few complicated things going on there. There really isn't. There are some things you can get in place to do that. And that leads me on nicely to our final question. Uh, well, second to last, actually, isn't it? Looking at what I just explained there, and based on the information that, that, that you might have about vehicle fleet compliance, how confident are you that your company is compliant with um, health and safety regulations and driving at work guides? Um, like I said, if this comes back at anything better than 80%, I know that you're uh, a bunch of liars. I'm only joking. I know that, that uh, we, we'll, uh, it won't be any surprise to me if it comes back in the, uh, the high part. So, Simon, how are we doing? Last couple coming in. And there we go. Okay, so that's probably better than, than what I would um, have imagined, but uh, yeah. Okay, that's, that's almost the end of the, uh, the, the presentation. Simon, I'll, I'll do that final question at the end of the questions, if that makes sense. Um, has anybody got any, any questions for Miss Simon on here today? No questions at all? No? Okay, Simon, nothing from you, no questions? Uh, you, you mentioned the, the grey fleet, and the chamber, we, that's all we have, we, we don't run a fleet, so all of our employees are running the grey fleet. What, what should, if you were chatting to Miranda over a glass of wine tonight, what, what should she be doing to be sure that she's not at risk, whether that's coronavirus related or just in general? Yeah, and I think that, that last part is, is, isn't, isn't coronavirus related. It's just best practice coming out of this that we've got some time maybe to get things in place. But it's, a, it's a good question. And I think the, the, the way to look at this is just to change that first sentence, which is you do, the chamber does have a fleet. It just doesn't own it. Um, so yourself, Jen, Darren, you know, these types of people using those vehicles, you still need to have all this in place. If you've got anyone that's driving on behalf of the company, it doesn't matter what the mode of transport is or who the owner of, of said vehicle is or how it's provided. Um, you know, when, when you drive to my office, Simon, sorry to pick on you, but you did ask the question. Um, when you drive to my office for a meeting, that's a journey that's taking place at the behest of the chamber. And so the chamber is responsible for that journey in the same way as if you were sat in the office on your laptop um, in that environment. So they need to make sure that you're qualified, competent, safe, comfortable, etc. So um, I think I read something um, recently that there's 14 million, I think it was, grey fleet drivers in the UK, um, which is absolutely huge. So it's, um, it's definitely an area that needs some attention. Al, did you have a question? Do you want me to try and unmute you? I don't know if you can do it, Sam, for Azar. Uh, I can do, yeah. No, no I've got it. Oh, there you go. Just for that, Mark, it was a really boring presentation. 
Thanks, Matt. I'm going to go get it. Um, uh, those who don't know me, uh, I introduce myself, uh, Amazo from uh, Tyroo, we're based in East Lancashire, uh, fleet management as well and maintenance, uh, more so business related to ties, MOT and servicing, but ties are one that we do um, as a whole. Um, you know, a lot of people, we never see, I picture ourselves involved in an accident. Yes, we visualize, picture ourselves uh, in being successful, but nobody ever pictures themselves being in an accident. So this, uh, uh, on February this year, there was um, a young lady, a primary uh, school teacher, I think she was about 22 years of age. Uh, she had an accident and obviously she lost her life, unfortunately, but it was related to uh, two defective ties. Um, and one of those, the third one being that it was underinflated by half the, the pressure that should be recommended. Um, nobody would have noticed that. Um, nobody actually uh, checks their tyres because um, we're all busy. Nobody's got time to do it. Um, garages are like ourselves, um, and I know Marks provides a, a platform for management, but we physically check those things for free. So. Um, you know, businesses out there are, are the, the biggest one where everybody's so busy, um, they just want to jump in the car and drive off. Had it been that this young lady uh, had some something in place to check those tyres, um, she would have still be with us. So tyres mm -hmm. are probably the biggest cause of death on the road at the moment. Mm -hmm. so we try to promote that as much as we can. Um, unfortunately, this young lady lost her life because two tyres were defected. She um, negotiated the bend and lost control of her vehicle. Yeah, it's a, it's a terrible uh, story. I thank you for your input. But um, I guess as well, it's something I didn't, I didn't mention was, was pressures. I guess with dormant vehicles for a number of weeks, you're going to be losing uh, a good chunk of your pressure, I would imagine. Especially this COVID-19. Uh, it has actually purchased 30,000 batteries. So we know what, what that's going to head uh, towards. People have not started their cars. Starting your car is not good enough. Uh, I think what you mentioned, driving on, around the block, and that's obviously you can't do that most of us anyway. Um, and we expect the, the factory is going to be flat when people jump into their cars. So you know what they're doing. They've ordered like 30,000 factories. No, Thanks, that's that. Jan's got um, a question related to that, Mark. Uh, Jan, do you want to bring in your question because it's linked to that comment? Do you want me to just read it out for you? Uh, no, it's all right. I'll there do it. Um, yeah, hi, Mark. Uh, long time hey, no Bob. speak. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, my battery in my car has been flat for over a month. Um, the AA came out and said, yeah, you, your battery needs replacing, but there's absolutely no point doing anything. Um, because the dealers are short and won't be able to do anything anyway. Where's everyone going to stand with lease vehicles? Because um, obviously when when the dealer service department's open again and people are able to drive a bit more, there's going to be a massive, massive influx of people needing new batteries. Where do you see warranties? And you know what, what I'm thinking there is, say, you, you go, right, okay, I need a new battery, but you can't get it into the dealer for four or five weeks or whatever. Mm. It's going to be tough, isn't it? I mean, I was just mentioned that AA and such like have been ordering quite a lot of uh, batteries, and I'm, I'm sure there's going to be a massive influx of uh, people that need to get into the garages, but I think that's going to start this week. I mean, well, Mark, you might have some input on this. Mark Lees, I don't know if you wanted to come in and give us your kind of view on that. <clears throat> I don't really, I, I don't have uh, expertise in, in batteries, I, um, but and, and warranties and so on. But um, I mean, it, it is a challenge. I'm watching in the chat actually people asking when garages are open, and and it is a bit of misconception that garages are are closed. They there there are some garages closed, of course, but they a lot of them have reduced um, to serving key workers only. But but and, and really, I'm talking about the franchise dealer network rather than the um, the independent network. The the independent network has actually mobilised quite well. Um, many of the independent garages across the UK are open and, and are supporting customers. So um, and because of block exemption, um, which is uh, means you you don't invalidate your warranty if you go and get your uh, vehicle uh, maintained somewhere other than the main dealer. 
means that you can still get your vehicle maintained. So and we, we're seeing a lot of that. I mean, uh, some of our big fleet customers will you know, favor the main dealer um, and they've been caught a little, a little short in the last few weeks because they've wanted to get vehicles maintained where they normally go. Um, and lo and behold, it's reduced capacity there. So, so they've pivoted and started using more independent garages, something like the AA or RAC approved garage network. Mm. Um, which are available that's, and that, that's really what we've seen um, yeah. just just whilst I'm talking I use this as an opportunity just to sort of re-emphasize something that Mark touched upon um, which is MOT suspensions so um, a lot of people are treating M MOT suspensions as an excuse to you know to, to run a vehicle on that's not roadworthy um, to be very clear your legal obligations whether the MOT is due um, or not are still there the vehicle must remain roadworthy um, as as are pointed out around tires you know tires must be uh, roadworthy the vehicle must be roadworthy just because they've said you don't have to have an MOT on on it doesn't excuse you for you know losing control of an unroadworthy vehicle and, and mowing down whoever it may be or, or even yourself yeah thanks Mark appreciate that um, I think that the, the danger level is quite high as well. If you think that the driver's not driven for a while and the vehicle's been dormant and there's no MOT and it's not been checked, it's, it's definitely worth, I think, an email to anyone that you've got to, or a call to anyone you've got driving on behalf of the company just to make them aware of, the, of this type of uh, stuff. Uh, anything else, Simon? Questions yeah, Mark Edwards from Serian's got a question on um, lead times for new vehicles. Mark, do you want to unmute yourself and just put that question? Yeah, we've got quite a number of vehicles coming up towards the end of the year we normally put 12 weeks in front of them to source them would you expect that to basically to start earlier now no not especially i mean there's been a, a small delay to production but they've literally been shut for, for three weeks and they, they might even play catch up on that dependent on what the, the demand is and um you hear conflicting reports on this but i've, I've been seeing pictures of fields full of vehicles from certain dealer groups and and, and whatnot at the moment so um, um, I, I wouldn't imagine it's going to be too much of an issue. It would be prudent to maybe start having conversations slightly earlier, just to be safe, but I wouldn't be overly concerned about that. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Mark. Um, Bit, do you want to put your question? Good afternoon again, by the way. That's two, co two calls in a day, Bit, together. People are going to be talking about us. <laughs> already are. Yeah. Same as already. <laughs> Of course. Uh, yeah, it's really around the safety. I mean, there's, there's issues around tyres and batteries. I've been stuck at home and not used to all this zoo. I don't, I'm, I'm even thinking if I need a bloody car now. Mm -hmm. And if I'm thinking that, my employer's thinking that. So, I mean, going forward, that's one thing. I mean, what kind of proactive checks have been made? Do you see that happening? Is there a campaign out there to inform? I mean, I, I think we have 6,000 companies within East Lanks, I don't know. There's something, that kind of number. Mm -hmm. uh, but surely it's something we should look to manage in some shape or form. If there is a project or there's an initiative there that we can try and bring some people together and be proactive about this. And then point them in the right direction that, you know, we, we're bringing all, uh, some of our sales force uh, off furlough, whether they like it or not, but, you know, they're coming back. Uh, mm -hmm. So we've got fleets of cars there. They're not being, they're not, they're not moved. You know, so I'm now getting concerned. Is like, as soon as they come off furlough, I'm going to have a series of claims. Well, I'd, I'd be surprised if I mean, I'm in the same in my business. You know, do we, do we need the, the level of vehicles that, that we've had in the past? Can we do more remote remote meetings and what? Like? I don't think you'd be on your own there, Biff. And, and actually, like I was saying before, with the electric vehicles, can you run vehicles that are more cost effective, more suitable? Uh, I think um, a lot of businesses have been looking at like the, the bloat, as it, so to speak, in their fleet, the surplus, and seeing where they can reduce it. I'd, I'd definitely share your concern with the safety aspect as well. I just I don't think that initiative is going to particularly come from the uh, leasing companies, but um, I think there's maybe something we can do on a more regional level to try and promote that. I know that Mr. Iqbal will probably be uh, keen to, to promote road safety uh, in and around these flanks. So, yeah, but... Certainly, I, I think there's going to be a lot of vehicles looking to go back to leasing companies at this moment in time. And uh, 
Um, you know, as much as that might not seem particularly self-serving, I think the, the best type of vehicle is the one that you don't need to pay for. Because whether you lease them, buy them, finance them, they're, uh, they're expensive pieces of kit and you absolutely should only run the ones that you, uh, that you need and that you can get some value from. So thank you, Bip. Yeah. A follow-up question, sorry. Yeah, go. Yeah. In terms of renegotiating them when we go back, I know, uh, I forgot the guy's name from Syria, sorry. Um, but it was, it was about a, a number of vehicles that are coming up for, to, for new vehicles. For those of us who are looking to shrink that, uh, or look at arrangements, are we going to find ourselves in a difficult position, or is that something we need to then say, look, what, what are going to be, you know, the like light bulb moment saying we need to look elsewhere because we're quite comfortable I suspect in terms of what we have and what we've had over the but it's during the time that everything has been going all right now I think you, I don't know about everybody else but you, get, you tend to find out who is critical as part of your supply chain uh, and who do we want to take forward I know um, Azar for, for instance from Tyra I know him quite well but I, I, I've got that peace of mind if I just pick up the phone I know with him, it's day or night, he'll come out and check it out. But I suspect not everyone's got that kind of, say, you know, peace of mind. No, and, and you, you, you struggle for that a little bit with the leasing company in, in that by nature, a lot of those are kind of bank owned and, and, and national and you maybe can't quite get that relationship. We, we kind of act as a bit of an intermediary, a buffer. We have a, um, you know, a kind of... Um, more volume relationship with, with the, the leasing company, so often we can act as that conduit. But because of the commercial nature of the lease contracts and the, the, the potential loss that the leasing company would suffer by taking vehicles back early, the level of negotiation on, on termination will be limited. I mean, as a general rule of thumb, um, the leasing company will, will want 50% of the remaining rentals on a lease agreement in order for you to hand the vehicle back early. So with a little bit of luck, you've only got six months left, let's say, on some vehicles, and you're only going to be paying three months rental to send those vehicles back. But um, but I wouldn't, if I'm being quite honest, I could tell you something different bit. But I think you know, approaching some of the leasing companies that we deal with and, and asking them for um, accommodation in view of the the, the climate, I, I from my own experience, I doubt they're going to be too receptive. Uh, that and that's probably not just because of the national bank owned businesses i just think it's because of the the nature of, of that type of agreement where it needs to run for a certain amount of time for the depreciation and the capital risk for the leasing company to come back in line but um but uh you know um Bip, if you've got anything specific like that you want me to look at or talk to me about give me a shout be more than happy to uh to see what your options are and stuff like that well, it might not be me but that's all right but yeah I'm going to get Tracy back at the office to give you a shout. Sure. No worries at all. Thank you. Thanks, Bip. That, um, that's not dissimilar to Jen's question. Um, Jen, do you want to ask it yourself or do you want me to paraphrase for you? Um, yeah, you mentioned um, the, the potential in future for lease agreements. Basically, you'll need less mileage, um, which, as you know, is my issue at the minute because I'm up and down country all over the place. If there's a possibility for... Um, getting away with doing less miles. Do you? Th how do you think they would respond? Um, the finance and, and leasing companies would respond to a current lease negotiation. So, say you've signed up and you know you've signed up for twenty thousand a year, mm. and you're paying through the nose. Mm -hmm. would they just tell you on your bike, or if you can guarantee you're going to do less miles from now on, would they For them. They're very willing to renegotiate when you ring them up and tell them that you uh, are doing more mileage and can they charge you more a month. Exactly where I was going with it, yeah. They're, uh, they're, they're very willing to have that conversation. That's, that's unfair though, but um, because some of them will have the conversation the other way as well. Not, not all of them, I would say the minority of them will negotiate down as well as um, up. Then what you might be able to do is extend the contract and by nature of the fact that that becomes a, another small lease period that's bolted onto your existing one that could be the time where you kind of play catch up with your mileage and make that adjustment to the rental there but um yeah it's, it's not like quite had a final year at like eight thousand miles or something and correct. Out. You might be able to do that with some of them but there's that they, they all have different views on that but it's certainly worth asking the uh yeah, well it is the question with diesel car because it can make a massive difference can't it the amount they add on Definitely. for an extra five thousand a year 
Well, I had um, one of the guys at our work had a, a car 20,000 miles a year for three years, and then we did a final year at 10,000 miles, and we finished up. I think we did 1,000 miles over the uh, the allowance. It worked out really well, and uh, I think it's important with, with mileage contracts to always only commit to what you know you're going to use. I mean, a lot of people are scared of being charged excess mileage at the end of contracts, but generally speaking, the amount of excess, excess mileage charge you receive for going over is the same of what it, as what it would have been pro rata on your monthly rentals anyway. Yeah. So it's not, it's not like a big penalty. It's just a, it's been presented to you all in one go rather than over the payment. So I, if I speak to people and they think they're going to do 15, 20, I'll always tell them to take 15 and then monitor it and see how they go. Because like you said, it's easier to put them up than it is to put them down. Mm. For sure. Okay. Cheers. Thanks, Jen. Thanks, Jen. Thanks, Jen. Thanks um, Mark. I think that's, all the questions unless i've missed there's a few people replying to some of the questions in the post i think i've taken all the questions if you if i've missed you just wave wildly at the camera or just unmute your microphone bit go on um there you go but you're unmuted now no now you are <laughs> stop messing about with it <laughs> i'm getting getting dizzy with all this really it's, it's something just tangent i just wanted to know what jen was eating, having for lunch because whilst Mark, Mark was away talking away, <laughs> it must have been embarrassing because I'm, I'm fasting at the moment, Jen. Oh, she's not. No, you are not. Oh, You're not fasting till Wednesday with me. Sorry, <laughs> right, I thought we were doing it surreptitiously just off camera. We're having chilli con carne and a potato. You're meant to be a professional, Jen. I can't believe it. If you missed that, you can watch it on YouTube later. <laughs> <laughs> People pay to watch videos like that, Jen. The girl's got to eat. Yeah. Uh, Bit, while you're on and we're talking about fasting, do you want a 30 second plug for I will fast for one day, please? Yeah, by all means. Oh, that's very kind of you. Uh, well, first, let me thank East Lights because, like other you know, agencies and networks, you are really at the forefront of it. So proud to be a member. Uh, and I'm not saying that because you just banged me a tenant, but it's true. Uh, we, I mean, can I just ask, I mean, if you know about Ramadan here, just raise your hands. As I you keep your hand down. Great. And how many people of those who know about Ramadan have actually experienced Ramadan? Please raise your hands. On Wednesday, uh, there's a group called Saffron Group. I'm not too, too much into it, but they're basically Lancashire-based second, third generation businesses like Azar and people. Uh, and they've reached out to offer an opportunity to fast for one day. But do it with them. So not just do it by yourselves or whatever. Experience it. Uh, we launched a bit of it in terms of a webinar uh, this morning. And I'll let Simon and Jen explain if that was any benefit. But for me, it was great. It's a kind of informal way and a step into finding out what Ramadan's all about. And, and also, I have an opportunity to share that with others. So you can either fast for a whole day, which I'm already regretting, because uh, I'm brilliant at eating and drinking, and giving that up, I'm, I'm hopeless at. But you can also just give up something like any one item, like Lent, like we're doing, you know, uh, as Christians, sometimes we give up an item for Lent. Um, but it's, it's giving up something that then makes you more mindful of the surroundings and the other, and the other things. And I think it was a there, there was this guy, Ian Jones, and I think uh, he's thanks to him though, because he, he supports this this part of the program as well, doesn't he? And he came with a great one. He says, you know, we're all in a storm at the moment. And, you know, we're, we're going to be coming out of this. But it's, it's also how we come out of this. And if we come out of it knowing each other that little bit better, it's got to board well for the future, hasn't it? You know, so, I mean, I have four people like Azar, and then we've reached out. He's thanks for taking the hat off and going in for the fast I think that's, that speaks volumes. It speaks volumes, not just to your service, but about the people. And I'll tell you one thing, and I'm sure as I won't tell everybody else. We did a quick debrief after this morning session. And one thing was the amount of respect those Muslims who, who came are actually giving out to those who are getting involved. They, they, I mean, they know what it's like, but it's, it's like, it's, it's, you know, it happens every year for them. It's the first time they have seen the community, the wider community, come in, right, and unselfishly say, well, let, we'll try it, yeah? And they say, all it's done is just born more and more respect from them. Absolutely up there 
So I can't, I mean, it's gone, talk about barometers, it's like that Boris thing, right? it's at that Nando scale, you know. <laughs> There is a there is a, a, a joining link which I'll put in the follow-up email. I can't find it now, but I'll put it in the follow-up email. I should have known not to give Bip 30 seconds either because we give him 30 seconds in the text five minutes. So thank you, Bip. Well, I'll put the follow-up link in the email. Um, um, and I've, I've got my final poll question, if that's all right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, let's, uh, do you, do let's you want to finish off? Because it'd be nice if it was the last thing that we did. Oh, okay. Well, you've done. Oh, go on. No, it's all right. I'll, I'll withdraw. I mean, okay. in term, I, I, think, I think we are finished. I, I just want to thank Mark, thank you uh, for putting that together. Mark from Keyfleet. We'll put the contact details for Mark uh, and the slides as well, Mark. Yeah, I'll, I'll send the, it across, no problem. In the follow-up email that you'll get shortly after this event, plus the link to uh, to register for Owl Fast for one day. Uh, do check out chamberlive.co.uk for all the future ones. Uh, everyone, I'm hoping to see you on Chamber Live Lunch and Learn a week on Thursday in your best spandex as well. That would be wonderful. Um, and I'll hand over to you to wrap up, Mark, with your final question, which yeah. uh, is now live. This is how you get out of the group. You're not allowed to come back until you answer this question. Sorry, you're not allowed to leave unless you answer this question. Yes. So if it's anything less than 100%, we're all staying here for the rest of the day. <laughs> Let's see, we have a nice positive finish on that. And hopefully uh, we all agree we can come out of this thing stronger on the other end, as uh, some of you have uh, previously said so we don't need to see that Simon we know it's 100% don't we it's I, I can I can share it mate because everyone's everyone's now voted and I'm pleased to say that everyone has voted as instructed by you with some Jedi mind <laughs> trick it's called bullying that yeah brilliant thank you Mark Great. thank you everybody well, thanks, Stay thanks safe. everybody for coming appreciate it thanks Chamber thanks everyone mm -hmm. speak to you all soon bye bye